Welcome back to the Under the Rug podcast. Uh, my name is Ramon and I'm joined by Nalini Tranklin, star of the show, Hello. so to speak. No. <laughs> um, and my beautiful mother. Uh, so, picking up from where we left off, that feeling of guilt and that feeling of undeservedness and I don't deserve the glory of this calling that God has placed on me because I'm unwilling to do all the things that are unrelated to it. I feel a lot of people actually preach this to a very lesser extent to the degree of toxicity it was preached to you uh, within your church history. This idea that you're not fit for the platform until you've scrubbed the toilets, until you've done the usher work. Yeah. And while I do agree with that sentiment largely, For what it's worth, you'd already done the groundwork growing up. Yeah. You'd spent pretty much your entire youth in the church. Yeah. Be that singing and leading worship in your local church under your father's leadership um, or just through your severe dedication to music as you're a classically trained pianist. Um, And so a lot of that had already been sorted and it seems you were well aware of that. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to note that even given that you were still willing to humble yourself to carry out this administrative work, the cleaning of the toilets, all of that, while still then having to put on a different hat, come to church on a Sunday, set up, lead worship, and get people into the house of God and in tune with the Spirit. So you need to get to the point where you've put in enough hours and put enough work to yeah. feel confident right. that you Absolutely. can act. Um, And I think the fact that you had an audience and you had people who were holding you accountable allowed you to not only humble yourself, as you said, but also be more confident in the fact that, yes, this is actually what I'm here to do. Right. I found, for me, it wasn't just the hot and cold of Sunday's exhilarating opportunity to take part in what I felt I was called for, And then the rest of the week where it was just bump and grind, basically. It wasn't just that. What began to creep in then was my need, I think, for affirmation from my leader, from my pastor, from my boss, that I was doing a good job. And, you know, were there any areas that needed tweaking? And instead I was, you know, told that, um, oh, what, you need a pat on the back now? You know, like... Right. What is this about now? What? Where is this coming from now that Nalini needs a pat on the back? Yeah. No, 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 it's not a pat on the back. I, ju- I just want to make sure that we're doing it right and, you know, get some sort of feedback from you that, that we're doing a good job and, you know, is there any way where we can improve upon? Yeah. So slowly, slowly it was little conversations like that where it would be thrown back on me as if I was the one now Oh, you want your ego stroked, do you? Right. Ah, you're getting too big for your boots. Okay. You're going to be on dishes duty now for the rest of the week or, all right. And then, and then it becomes disheartening all over again, you Mm. know? So I would go home quite often, most days, disheartened by the day. Those small snide remarks, they definitely stack up. And that's definitely indicative of an abusive and toxic working relationship. Um, So I'm curious to know then in more detail what form did the abuse take? Okay. Um, The scary thing is sometimes it was actually while I was on stage Mm -hmm. leading worship and the Spirit of God was moving incredibly in the room and we knew that we needed to just give the Holy Spirit time to do his work in people. And so we used to call that with the worship team, we used to just call that, let's just linger in the spirit. And I would turn to the team and I'd go, you know, just just keep going. Let's just keep going on this for, for a moment. And, you know, I'd be in prayer or my eyes would just be closed as we just, I think we would soak up what the spirit of God was doing in that moment. And then suddenly the pastor would be here. You know, and he would grab the mic and take control of 
you know, we're going to pray now. or And it would be quite an aggressive, abrupt, we've, we need to cut this now. And I would walk away thinking, oh, okay, maybe, you know, we just went on too long or um, that's not the direction he wanted us to take. So then slowly, slowly what I would do is if I felt like, okay, we're really entering into a bit of a, just a linger moment, I would look to the pastor and, you know, just want to get his affirmation that, okay, this is okay to keep going. And then he'd signal, you know, he'd, he'd be like, yeah, right. yeah, you just keep going. Right. Or he'd be like, you know, pull it back. Mm. Right. Um, so he would give me those, those cues. So I put it down to, oh, I just need to get used to how he communicates with me. Right. What I didn't realize until much, much later was that was also a part of the control beginning mm. to seep in and elements of narcissism beginning to seep in. Because that would have uh, caused you to question your own abilities as a worship leader, right? Absolutely. Like, I can't identify the cues. And you've spent your entire life completely involved in this process. Yeah. You know, for as long as you can probably oh, yeah. remember. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, while he does take the form of an experienced pastoral figure, he's not the worship leader. Right. He's not the worship director. Right. But in my eye, he's still higher than the worship director. Yes. And so because of his standing and the added pressure of the fact that he was my boss, you know, I would have to jump at every little. And so this unease began to grow on the inside of me like I'm kind of losing my edge. Mm. You know, like I can't, I can't tell where he wants to take this. I thought I had picked up that we were heading in the same direction and then he he completely changed it that morning or or did something completely out of the norm that threw me into a complete tiz where it would be very visually evident to people yeah. that, oh, yeah, man, she got caught out. That's awkward, you know? Yeah, and, you know, not to prescribe, but common indications of toxic and sociopathic and often even narcissistic uh, relationships and behaviors is wanting to try and ensnare an individual right. into the narcissist's or the sociopath's game and yes. wanting to flip their world upside down where they don't know they're left from their right and never leave them with the ability to make the right call on oh. something. It's often noted as a double bind. So I'm curious to know if you ever felt as if you were being, being put in double binds, if you never felt like there was a correct answer to the predicaments, if you felt like, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it began to grow over time, but very subtly. Um, I think my first experience is really of, of what you describe as a double bind would probably be in our staff meetings, okay. which would happen once a week. So Mondays the office would be closed because, you know, Sunday was obviously a working day. And then Tuesday morning we would start our day with a team meeting and we would all gather together, everybody. Didn't matter, you know, whether it was the receptionist or the senior pastor, we were all together in the room. And the senior pastor would obviously run that meeting and we would go around the room and touch on every area of the church, you know, so new Christians, ushers, you know, the meet and greets, I don't know, the mums and babies room, the Bible college, like every facet of church life, okay? And, of course, worship as well. And sometimes it would be a kind of a smirk, so Nalini. Sunday and I would just get this cold chill up my spine coupled with public humiliation because now there's pin drop silence in the room everyone's eyes are on me from staff while I am frantically racking my brain trying to figure out what went wrong on Sunday like oh my gosh what, what have I missed okay and 
you know, with dry mouth, I would eat like, um, okay, pasta, do you want to maybe just elaborate a little bit? Oh, I think you know. I think you know. And then that anxiety and nervousness would just would saturate my body. I mean, I would I would be riddled with pins and needles and sweat and you know, I would look like a lobster because <laughs> I was so yeah. embarrassed by and then it would come out that, you know, we had introduced a song that the congregation really hadn't taken to that day and it was just before the pastor was meant to come up and preach and it just deflated the atmosphere before he got to speak and then he had to work extra hard to, you know, lift the atmosphere of the church, I suppose. And, and of course, I'm devastated. I'm devastated that we made that mistake and, you know, it'll never happen again. Um, okay, sure. So, so maybe that's not a song for the church. Oh, so you think we'll never sing that song again now? Oh, okay. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about it being because of when it, where it was positioned in the service. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. All right. So it was a good song. It just, I'm sorry then that it was positioned at the wrong time during the service. No, you totally could have it just before I preach. Oh, okay. Mm. I don't understand. Like my brain is just, I don't get what he's trying to say. Meanwhile, what he's trying to say is it's a great song. The church will totally get it, but you probably need another three or four runs of it before it will then be perfect for immediately before I preach. Right. But I don't know that. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he's trying to go in. So it's this game of almost like cat and mouse, you know, Although I have to ask even then, because you've told me now that retrospectively you've kind of figured out what it was he actually wanted. But was there ever a time where you actually felt like you carried out what it was he actually wanted as things progressed? No, definitely not. And it got worse as things progressed. And what that did for me was it... I ended up in this vicious cycle of thinking I am certainly not worthy for this role, which is what I was thinking in the first week mm -hmm. of me working in the church. Um, I am certainly not worthy of it. My skill level is obviously not up to par mm -hmm. to be able to fulfill this role well. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously not delivering what my pastor thinks he has is paying me for. Mm. So I continually felt like I was under the mark yeah. continually. But where I began to see greater damage was the more angry he started becoming towards me. And how did this escalate? Was there any mitigating, any specific circumstances that caused it? Or was it just a gradual progression? It was a gradual progression of what I thought in my mind's eye, he's thinking I've got the wrong person for the job. Yeah. And now I'm just going to make life as unbearable as possible so that you quit. Mm -hmm. Because it kind of felt like we both knew it was not working. It's interesting as this funny little trend that you see in many online circles these days you see it a lot on twitter where a visual artist on twitter with a reasonable following let's say like three thousand followers who's creating cutesy little cartoon pin-up images uh, will be selling their art for let's say fifty dollars a pop 90 percent of the time in these situations the artists are already severely underselling themselves but it's very difficult to know how competitive you need to be in an industry as freeform as the creative industry, as unregulated, especially in the Twitter universe. What will often happen is these people will get a message from someone saying, hey, I love your art. Uh, I was just wondering if you could do a little sketch for me, uh, but could you drop your price down to say maybe $20? Because honestly, I feel like $60 is way too much. And, you know... Fingers crossed, the artist won't short sell themselves. And you always see the story where the artist says, sorry, my price is my price. If you like my art, you'll support my prices. Yeah. And 
moments later, the conversation has a massive flip. Ah, well, your art wasn't good to begin with. It was never great. I can go to someone else. Um, There are other people out there who are more qualified, who have more reasonable prices. You're just being unreasonable. Yes. Now, the difference between this Twitter situation and your situation is, in this case, near globally, people have come to start start recognizing the importance of appropriately placing value on creators for the work that they do. And so these little conversations often blow up online and the artist gets the recognition that they deserve because everyone wants to rally behind them and support art. Yeah. Because so many people have been stung in this way. In your situation, there was no Twitter. There was no way to take this no way to create some kind of viral campaign out of this, not that you would have wanted to, and not that many of these artists intend on doing that. Instead, you're almost ensnared in this constant work-life balance Yeah. where every day you come home, you're exhausted, you're having to come home to two young kids, so there's a lot of work to be done on the home front, and then every time you go back into work, you're dreading it, dreading it, dreading it. Yeah. And it almost seems like you're seemingly very visible cries for help as non-explicit as they may have been were falling on deaf ears from those around you in the office. Is there any reason why it seemed like nobody was doing anything? I would love to ask them that very same question. And it's actually something that I have carried with me for years. Why didn't anyone say anything? Hmm. My father was actually the Bible school dean at the time. So he was a part of these staff meetings. He witnessed these blow-ups that would happen during the meetings where I would be completely annihilated, lambasted in front of the team. Mm. And even his hands were tied, even as my own dad, because he wasn't sitting in that room as the capacity of Nalini's father to protect his daughter, He was sitting in the meeting in the capacity of Bible school dean. Right. So it almost felt as though we were in this pyramid organizational structure where the kingpin is the ultimate authority and all of you are subservient then to me. and to my needs, and to my wants, and to how I want things done. So no one had a voice. Mm. No one dared to have a voice. And it just escalated. Um, Do you feel then, now looking back, had you gone and spoken to more of the other creatives around you? Because I know that you've retrospectively done that that there could have been a breaking down of the structure earlier on had these issues been addressed head on on mass because once again if you draw back to that twitter parallel people have all experienced this very same thing in one way or another yeah and Nobody wants to be quiet about it, but it's very easy to be quiet about it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are thousands and thousands of cases every day where artists are shortchanging themselves yeah, because they don't know what their art is worth and they don't want to, you know, be shown as a prude and they're willing to buckle under financial integrity if it means keeping some semblance of artistic integrity, whatever that might look like to them. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there would have been ways Look, out of the situation? For, for my husband and I, I mean, he was seeing the effects of this very toxic environment mm. on me every mm. evening when I'd come home from work. And as time progressed, ended up, you know, having panic attacks and my dad witnessed it. I mean, everyone could see the effect that it was having on me, but we had no idea how to break free from it how to bring about the change because we had no point of reference to fix it, okay? Um, 
So for us, ultimately, it led to us leaving the church, mm. which we thought, okay, maybe this will be the wake up call that's needed for them to realize that things cannot carry on as they are. And actually, you have been experiencing ill treatment and we are sorry and this needs to change and we're going to change to make sure that we're nurturing and loving our people the way that Christ would have us love and nurture them. Mm. But instead, it actually resulted in hell on earth. Okay. Well, I'm curious to know then, before you made the decision to leave the church, and before you made the announcement that you were going to be leaving the church, um, how bad had it gone? And how affected had you become by the whole ordeal? Okay, I I refer back to this one event that we had for the worship team, which was a styling day Mm -hmm. with the band we wanted to really up our game in terms of image and presentation and so we'd hired this um, incredible stylist who was killing it in the game um, in London and she came on board this Saturday morning to help us with hair makeup and styling wardrobe Mm -hmm. and so the plan was we'd have the whole team there and have a fantastic morning together you know and then back on stage Sunday morning So, of course, I was entrusted with, you know, running this whole thing and making sure that it happened, which, you know, was my privilege. I couldn't wait to do it. So put word out to the team, you know, had obviously announced it at the practice on the, you know, the week before and a couple of weeks prior by email. So had put it out to the team that, listen, we've got the stylist coming in. We really want to up our game. So it would be really great if you guys could come. However, I didn't make it compulsory for the team, Mm. which in hindsight now, I wonder if I maybe would have, although I don't know if I would have. But I didn't make it compulsory because I was very aware that Saturdays are the predominance of the team's only day off. Okay, they're fully involved on Sunday. I mean, we've got multiple services Sunday morning, multiple services Sunday evening at different campuses. Quite often, the same team is being used across the city. And so Sunday is no day off. And then they're all back at work on Monday. So I didn't want to make it compulsory for the team. I hoped that the team would just come and they would just be in support of it uh, voluntarily. The lady arrives on the Saturday morning. We're there, we're setting up. She's got her whole wardrobe out and it's fantastic and I'm all excited and her makeup and, you know, slowly, slowly band members start trickling in. But I can honestly tell you it was a handful Mm -hmm. of a team of about 50, 60 people. I think we maybe had 10 or 15. Right. So about three quarters of the way through this stylist's first presentation of the day, I hear the front door open and I, like the hair on the back of my neck, stood to attention because I suspected it was the senior pastor coming to check to see how things were going. So I didn't want to cause a raucous, so I just stayed in my seat and waited, thinking that maybe he would come and join us and sit next to us. Well, he didn't. He stood in the back, you know, in his big black trench coat with his arms in his pockets. And... To my dismay, I just heard abruptly the words, sorry, can Nalini come to my office, please? And the lady, you know, very nervously stopped in her tracks mid-sentence. Everyone in the room turned round and looked to see what was going on. And I very awkwardly and very embarrassedly got up out of my chair and just, you know, sorry, sorry, um, went to join him in his office, yeah. which unfortunately was in the room immediately next door to where we were having this presentation. Of course. You know, wooden floorboards. And I knew, mm. I just knew what was coming. And um, I closed the door of his office and, oh, he just... Oh, he just ripped me to shreds how dare you how dare you spend the church's money on this woman to come and sort out our team's styling when you can't even get the full team here how dare you how dare you waste the church's money on this oh that was 
I was mortified and I knew it didn't matter what I said in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like even if I had said to him, you know, some of my team leaders have families and Saturdays are their only days as a family. You know, I didn't want to make it compulsory. I just, I wanted to, I was going to just send them the notes. It didn't matter what I said in that moment. It was only going to exasperate him all the more. He was only going to get even more vicious. And all I could think of was these guys are immediately next door. We have this, mm -hmm. we have this non-Christian stylist who just is the top in her field, the top in her game, coming to a church in London to equip a worship team, people who love God, mm -hmm. you know, religious people, Christian people. And all I could think of was, this is her point of reference. Mm -hmm. This is what she's hearing. This is what she's witnessing coming out of the church. How? How is this right? Like, so I was just, I was like, Lord, how do I diffuse this? How do I pull this in? So all I could do in that moment was just own it and be extremely apologetic for stuffing up and I am so sorry. I, I didn't think, you know, Sophie would come. I thought they would come and I am so sorry and this will never happen again. And I'm trying to keep my voice down consciously, but he's just giving it to me. How dare you? Who do you think you are? And, you know, this is this always happens with you. You know, now it becomes a, this is just what do you expect when Nalini's involved in the equation, right? right? This is not the first time, da, 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 and he just let rip. And then when he was done, he went, okay, leave my presence. And I had to now muster up the courage and the strength to go back in there and pretend like nothing had happened, which I did. I just, I walked back in to my humiliation. Everyone was staring at me as I walked in. The lady didn't know what to do with herself. And I just had to go, oh, I'm so sorry about that. You know, big smile, you know, the mm -hmm. big Sunday smile. Everything's fine, everything's good. Don't you worry about that. So where are we? Let's carry on. You know, while I'm wiping my eyes and trying to gather myself for the rest of the day that was still ahead of us. Oh, that for me. I remember in the car on the way home thinking, how much more of this are you going to be able to cope with? Mm -hmm. How much more of this are you going to be able to cope with? The panic attacks increased, the anxiety, the sleepless nights, the waking up in the night, hardly being able to breathe. My hair started falling out. My marriage was like, we nearly broke up. Like my husband didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I was. I was so beaten I felt like I felt like a horse that had been whipped to the point and I remember my mum sharing this picture with me she's an avid horse rider and I remember my mum sharing this picture with me she said it's like a horse being whipped to the point where it cannot take another lashing and it just falls to its knees and refuses to get back up mm. And that was me. I just, I remember some mornings driving into the office and stopping on the side of the M11 motorway with my dad having to rub my back as I stood out leaning on the bonnet of the car, trying to breathe. I mean, what is wrong with this picture? Like, isn't church meant to be your safe place? Isn't that where, where you're meant to grow and flourish? And instead, I am suffocating, like physically could not breathe because of the abuse. 
Guys, thank you for joining us today. I was literally squirming in my seat listening to the playback of this episode. The scenes that I paint for you are as vivid in my mind today as they were when they happened. Now, if you haven't grabbed a copy of my part one memoir, The Orange Hue, can I please encourage you to get it? It's out in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. I'm telling you, you will not be able to put it down. I believe it will challenge, stir, and ignite a fire on the inside of you. The closing episode of this series will have you gripped, so if you want first dibs, be sure to join our Patreon family. It's through your financial support that this podcast even exists. If you've been impacted by anything covered today, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll close with this. Our God is a restorative and loving God. He literally plucked my family and I out from this abuse. He rescued us and has taken us on a journey of incredible healing. It's the only reason I am able to talk about it now. I love you. I'll talk to you soon.